we're going to spend about the next uh, 35 to 40 minutes going through our, our Navigate Course Manager uh, Learning Management System, um, the features, the functions, the benefits of, of that system. I have, again, muted those phone lines until the end of the session when I'll, I'll open those up and we'll, uh, we'll try to take some, uh, some questions that way. If you do have any questions during the session, please feel free to use the chat box in the bottom right of your, uh, of your panel and um, I'll take those as I, uh, as I can. So with that said, we're going to get, uh, get started talking about our, our Navigate system. Now for those that are familiar with using an online learning management system, as much as I'd love to tell you that we have revolutionized the world of online learning, the truth is that all the major uh, LMS systems share a core feature set. So if you can do something in Blackboard or WebCT, you can do it in our system and vice versa. And, and I don't see that as a bad thing. I see that as, actually as, um, as a relief. For, for many instructors and professors who who might be used to one platform and then they have this this nightmare that they're going to have to switch to a new system. And the good news is, is that, again, if you can do it in the system you're already using, you can do it in ours. There are some differences, and one of those, for those that are on the call that might be coming from a Blackboard environment, one of the first things that you're going to notice is that our system simply doesn't look like Blackboard or, or WebCT. It's not laid out the same way. And that's one of the, the key strengths of, of our platform that, that we utilize. We use a, a, what's known as a one-page layout. So instead of you having to go and search for your administrative tools, um, now my, my role is not to, to disparage systems like Blackboard or WebCT. I just mentioned that they all have a core uh, feature set. So what I'll tell you, though, is that one of the main pain points when I talk to folks, we'll talk about Blackboard for a moment. When they're coming and they're thinking about coming from Blackboard, one of the things that they, they talk about often is this idea of having to add content and jumping through a series of hoops in order to make that happen. And sometimes when you, you have to drill in six or eight links deep, go to an administrative page, you might have another page of another 20 or 30 links, decide where that item has to go and whether it's an assignment or not and, and how that's going to be viewed by your students. With our system, what you see is what your students will also see, with the exception that they're never going to have access to areas in the administrative side over here on the left-hand side where I've got my marker, they're never going to see things like the test bank or um, the administrative tools that are available to, to instructors. Otherwise, though, it's going to be the exact same look and feel. So that if you get a student asking you, well, how do I, you know, where's the PowerPoint for Chapter 1, it's wherever you see it. So you're not looking at two different interfaces, which is what happens with some other systems. The other thing, too, is that if you want to engage your editing tools, instead of you having to drill into the back end of the site to actually make those changes, you really just have to click on the button that says Turn Editing On or the link of the same name in the administration block on the left-hand side. Now, doing that is going to refresh the page and bring to the forefront of your classroom all of your editing tools. So those tools now are right here in this main classroom. So as you begin to hover over different, um, <coughs> excuse me, as you begin to hover over the different resources that are in the course, you'll see that you've got icons that allow you to make changes. You can uh, use arrows to move, X to delete. Uh, there's an icon with a pencil that allows you to edit or override something that's in the, um, in the system. So if you want to change the name of a resource, you can simply click on the pad and pencil icon and update that. Or you can hide these things completely from student viewing if you want. So where the images or those icons as you roll over the content, that's your ability to edit items already in the course. By engaging the editing tools, this is what allows you to, to actually start adding new content into the system. So you can choose to add a resource or add an activity. Adding a resource, most thought of as those things like uh, documents or web links or um, videos if you have those that you might be using in the classroom, whereas an activity is more the student has to take action on something in order to uh, either receive a grade or by a certain date. And we're going to go through those, those, two different, um, those two different capabilities right now. In the Add a Resource drop-down area, the two most widely used options are Compose Web Page and Link to a File or a Website. We're going to start by talking about linking to a file or a website. So this is where you can start adding content into the course. So if it doesn't already exist in the classroom and you have your own documents, your own classroom policies, PowerPoints, what have you, if it's in digital format, you can upload it into the, into the course. So you can do that by giving this a name. And whatever you type in here is exactly what your students will see when you save this resource. If it is a web address, you can simply scroll down to the section that says link to file our website and in the location field, type in that address. And you can scroll on down and click Save and Return to Course if you have more items to add, Save and Display if you want to see what this is going to look like to your students, or you can click Cancel to cancel that operation. If it's a file, so it's a PowerPoint, it's a PDF file, it's a Word doc, instead of typing in the location, you just simply click the button that says Choose or Upload File. 
then it's no different than attaching a picture to an email. You find the file, you double click it, pull it right on into the system, click save and return to course or save and display and you can view that, uh, you can view that item right there if you want. So adding content is, is very simple and very straightforward to do. With just a few uh, clicks of, of the mouse, you're able to, to pull things in right off your computer and store them right into the classroom that students can begin using and, and interacting with. Now every area where you can add something into our site has, it's called a what you see is what you get web editor. So these little, this collection of icons here. And really what you should be thinking is when you look at this, you should be thinking that it looks very familiar. It should look like almost like a Word document when you're editing um, a document. You have the ability to change font color and size and you can insert pictures and it's very easy. It uses a graphical interface. And the idea here is that you don't need to know how to, to code these things in. You just simply click a button, import a picture, add some text so you can give a description to it if you want, and then your students are able to, to see that along with your file as soon as you click save. Now there are some instructors that I talk to that are using videos that are shared, or excuse me, that are stored on YouTube, TeacherTube, or Vimeo, any of the video sharing sites. And one of the things that, that those instructors tell me quite often that they, they have a challenge with is they might show that video at the front of the room and then afterwards they either have to email the links to their students or the students go out to YouTube and they, they search for that video and you know there's, there's really no telling if they're going to find the, the video that you want them to, to view or not or if they're going to come upon something totally unrelated. So of course they can come into YouTube and they can type in here hats of uh, incident management is one I use myself. Um, if I were to just type in hats I can come up with you know 100 different results that have nothing to do with actual incident management. This is the video I want my students to actually watch or to be viewing. If I click on this page though, a couple of things happen with regard to the video in YouTube. On the right hand side of the page, there are a series of videos that are supposedly related, but invariably there's always one that shows up that uh, um, it's more of a comedian than anything else. It has nothing to do with you know, the message I want my students to be getting. To say nothing of the fact that the comments that are on most of these YouTube videos, they can, you know, there's, there's really no filter. So if you want to make this nice and easy for your students to be able to view a video, you found a few that are great, you want to use them in the classroom, maybe you even have your own channel on YouTube or TeacherTube that you've stored your own videos, you can stream these directly into the classroom. And you can do that by coming into our class and choosing to compose a web page. And I'm going to stop there and tell you that you don't have to know how to code HTML. It uses, again, that same what you see is what you, uh, what you get web editor. You simply give this a, a name, scroll to the section, that says compose web page and the opposing arrows icon that you're going to click and that forces this into text mode for, um, for you. You can come back out to YouTube, you can click on the button that says share in your, your video here, then click embed. You're just going to right click and copy this information here and come back out to our class and paste it right in. So just doing nothing more complicated than copying and pasting, you can scroll on down click save and display and instead of the video looking like this to your students, the video can play like this for your students right in the classroom browser. So if you do have videos that, like I said, you're, you're sharing these on any of the video sharing sites or you've come upon them uh, from YouTube or TeacherTube and you want them in the classroom, you want to have a way to deliver them to the students, you want to make it easier for them to find it, but you'd also like to know if they're using or watching the video, streaming it into the classroom will, will help you accomplish those things because, because it now technically resides within the system, anytime someone clicks to go out and view the video, you'll get a, a time and date stamp of that, uh, that activity. So you can actually now run a report and say, how many people actually watched the video? Is this video as good as I think it is? You know, I've got 20 students and only two of them bothered to watch it. You know, maybe you adjust what you do the next go around or, or maybe you make this part of an assignment where they have to actually watch the video. Now I know that what we're seeing here has the, the heading of um, emergency care and transportation of the sick and injured, so this is an EMT basic program. But really the reason why I chose this course isn't because everyone on the call here is, is, related or is in the EMS field, but because the functionality of the site remains the same regardless of which course we're looking at. So I wanted to just point that out as we go through that even though it does have some EMT uh, theme to it, this, we have these types of courses available for just about all of our lists and if we don't have it currently available, it's it's a good bit, it's under development already for, um, for courses in, in all of the lists that we publish in. Now, the purpose of today is to give you a good overview of the functionality of the system and not to drill into every single feature that's available in the platform. One thing I do want to mention is that part of my role um, here at Jones and Bartlett is to provide customer-based training after the adoption of a curriculum. 
So once you actually get the, the textbooks and the printed materials and now you're looking to use the technology, you can come back to us as often as you want. And we can do this as a one-on-one -on -one kind of training on WebEx like this where we can either, like I said, conduct it one-on-one -on -one with you or if you have uh, instructors or, or coworkers that need to be part of that, we can do that online as well. So that we can, we can do that as many times as you need so that if you do need to have extra training to get up and running and roll this out smoothly, we can help you with that. In addition to the post-adoption training, we also provide all the technical support for the platform. So if your students or yourself, if you have a problem logging in or something isn't appearing in the, in the site, you can come on in and you, know, you can come into our tech support team. Our hours are from 8.30 at night till 12.30 in the morning, and you can contact one of our folks and, and you'll get help right away. So those are the two main areas here that get used in the Add a Resource drop-down area, Compose web page and link to a file or a website. Moving over to the Add an Activity drop-down, this is where we have things that the students must take action on for either some kind of a grade or because there is a submission deadline. You've got different types of homework assignments that can be added into the, um, uh, into the site for you. You can, the, the differences between advanced uploading and upload a single file is simply with advanced uploading, you can have your students upload multiple files at once to you. The other option is, as the name implies, upload one file at a time. You can have online text where you can basically create a scenario-based um, question if you want. You can call this uh, homework. And again, whatever you give this as a name, your students will see. You can actually type in the question here. You can choose what the grade is going to be, what the, what the top grade potential is, whether that's 100, if it's a scale. You can create customized scales such as pass, fail, or complete and complete if you want. You can choose the date that the assignment is available from, and you can lock that so that this is only available from the 11th to the 18th, and say, yes, I do want to prevent late submissions so that as of 2 216 on the 18th, no one can submit any further um, assignments or um, homework submissions to you for this. You can click Save and Return to Course or Save and Display. Going into the classroom, now that we've added that in, the one thing that I always like to talk about at this point is that whenever you add something from the Add an Activity dropdown that either has a great potential or a submission deadline, it will add that item into the main classroom for you. It will put an instance of that into the gradebook for you. But it also stops and recognizes that you most likely want your students to know about this. And where some other systems actually make you go in and add the assignment and then add notifications and then email your students, what our system does is it integrates the, the calendar and the notification system in with the activity list. So anytime, again, you add something that has a great potential or a submission deadline, it will automatically add notifications for you in the calendar, it puts a notification in the upcoming events block for your students, which is basically a two-week snapshot of all pending deadlines. And then one final place we can't see is that it also puts a notification on the student's home page. So when they first log in, they might see, you know, health and wellness program, and right underneath it, they're going to see homework week one. And they can click on that and take action, or if they miss that, they'll, they can come into the course, they'll see it in the main, uh, the main area of the class, or this active syllabus area, and they'll also see it in two other locations in the upcoming events field and in the calendar. So again, that happens automatically for you once you add any activity that either has a submission deadline or a great potential. And I'm just going to go through real quick. I've got uh, a few more people that have uh, that have joined, and I'm just going to close out those. Um, I'm just going to close out those uh, those lines that are that are open real quick here, and then we're going to move into talking about some of the other activities that are that are available for for individuals. Okay, so going back into the Add an Activity dropdown. I talked about the online text, I talked about uploading files, and now we've got the offline activity. And the offline activity is because we know that not all instructors are going to use this um, for a purely 100% online course. We do know that in some of the fields in which we publish, it's you know a requirement that they must meet with their students and the students must demonstrate comprehension of skills. So the offline activity allows you to keep a record of everything that you're doing, both online and in person with your students, but keep a record of that in the online uh, classroom. So you could come in here and, for example, we could call this a CPR class and I could type in where the class is being held and anything they must have with them and when it's going to be, you know, when we're going to be doing this. We're doing this, uh, you know, tomorrow and it's only running for a couple of hours tomorrow, so we're going to shut this down at, um, we'll say, 515. 
and I'm going to come in here and click Save and Return to Course. Now in doing this, again, just like the online activity, it's going to put the instance of the CPR class in the main area of the classroom for me. It put it into the gradebook for me because I can keep grades on offline assignments. Again, those don't have to be a numeric value. Those can be a, a custom uh, scale that you create. So it can be a, a pass-fail or um, go-no-go or, or complete-incomplete if you want. And it sends out notifications to the students in their calendar, upcoming events block, and finally on their home page. So again, the differences between the type of assignments, you can have individuals upload content to you. They can respond to items you put on their screen. So in the instance of the online assignment, I could type in a scenario-based question, and then when the student clicks on it, they'll see your question, and they'll have a, an open text field where they can type in a response to you and submit it to you for grading. One thing you can also do with the online assignment is you could go out to YouTube, do that same, that same process I showed you when I, I talked about composing a web page, and simply copy and paste that video right into your assignment. So now instead of it just being something that the students watch, you can actually tie it to a gradable assignment by copying and pasting the video in. You can even add questions to the video so that directly underneath the, the video playing, there might be a question that says, at minute five and 10 seconds, what was the speaker's main point? And that can be what they respond to you with and what they're graded on. Moving forward, you have the ability to set up an attendance uh, roster here in the system. What this does is, even though this is really geared for those in-person sessions, if you do turn this on, this will collate or excuse me, compile a list of all of your uh, attendees in the course, and then allow you to simply mark whether they're absent, present, tardy, or excused. And with uh, toggling one option, you can integrate it with the gradebook and you know make this um, almost like an assignment where there's a grade associated with uh, how much they've they've been in attendance for those for those sessions, if you want. The chat functionality is a group-based um, text messenger, okay, so it's more of like an instant messenger. It allows you to set up um, times when you can have people come online and in, in real time text messages to you back and forth. One of the things you can do with this, however, is you can set this up to occur either one time, so it's only going to happen tonight at, at 7 o'clock, for example, or I can say I want this to happen every single Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and then this way my students know that 7 o'clock on Wednesdays, I can go in and I have this standing um, office hour or this virtual office hour with my students. Now, the thing that I always like to point out about the chat functionality is that when you come in here, this option here that says everyone can view past sessions, it defaults to no, and in the coming weeks, that's going to begin defaulting to yes, but you can toggle it for now to simply say yes. What will happen is if you have a chat session with your students and you're talking about a particular topic, um, such as respiratory care, for example, and it's a really good back and forth. There are a lot of good questions that were asked. There was uh, a lot of you know, good information you provided to your students. Now it's three or four weeks later and you're preparing for a midterm or a final, and instead of you having to, to take those questions again in another chat session, by enabling this option here that says yes, a student can go back and click on the link for that prior session, so it occurred you know, uh, three weeks ago, and when they click on that link, it'll generate a transcript of everything that occurred within that chat session, so they can use that for review purposes if you want. And you can enable or disable this whenever you want. So if you do set up a chat session, and then a week or two later you think, well, it'd be great if I could, you know, make this a, a transcript, you can simply change it at that time, and it'll go, and it'll, it'll create those transcripts for your users. Coming back into the Add Activity drop-down area, now again, a couple of these things I'm going to I'm going to skip over because they're best suited for when we do one-on-one -on -one training sessions. But I really want to focus on the the key elements of the system. Now, discussion forums are not new to to learning management or to distance learning at all, actually. And for us to to talk about forums, there there has to be a pretty good reason why I'm bringing up a forum because they're in every single system that's out there. And the reason why I'm talking about forums, and and for those that might not know what a forum is, think of it as a um, a digital bulletin board. So if you think of uh, an old school bulletin board where you actually post your, your notices and you know all those items you have for sale up on, on a wall somewhere, this is an online version of that. Someone can post a message, everyone that's part of that forum can see it and respond to it. And in the educational setting, that has a lot of benefit. You can continue conversations with students, you can, um, you know, you can generate some really good thought-provoking uh, conversation between students and instructors. The downside is that in most forums across most systems, when an instructor posts something, everyone can see it right then and there. So if you have uh, a student who is 
we'll say an overachiever, and you have, and they've always got a, a great response, and you post a question at three o'clock, and by four o'clock they always have a wonderful response. You might have someone else in the class who's less en enthusiastic or uh, less motivated. They come in at 4:30, copy that student's response, change a few words around, and call it their own. And that's a that's a common shortcoming in a lot of these uh, the forms that are available, which is the reason why I want to talk about an option in our forum here. So I can come in here, and just by using this drop-down menu, I can toggle between different types of forums. And the forum that helps instructors, and that we've had a lot of positive feedback on, is the Q&A forum. The Q&A forum puts a bit of a spin on that scenario. So you post your question at 3 o'clock. Your first student comes in uh, normally um, at 3.30, posts a response. I come in at 4 o'clock, and I copy the first student's answer. Now, as the instructor, you switch this to Q&A forum mode. You post your question at 3. I come in at 4. All I see is your question. So I figure that um, you know, the student I'm used to copying off, they must be running late. So I'll come back later on. I come back at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I still only see the instructor's question. So you told me to have this turned in by midnight or respond by morning or, or what have you, and I don't want to fail this. I open up my book. I do the reading he told me to do. I look up the answer. I type in my response. I click Submit. As soon as I click Submit, it opens up the form for me. Lo and behold, my classmates have been discussing it all day long. I couldn't see it until I had responded to the instructor's original post. So it takes the... Um, the power, if you will, of these discussion forums, and it puts it back where it belongs, which is with the instructors. So you have the ability to determine things like, can they see responses without responding to, to me? Can they edit their response? So a natural question I get when I do smaller sessions like this is, well, what's to stop a student from simply typing in dot, 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 save, and then copying and pasting that answer all the same? And the truth is, you can. You can determine how many times they can edit, whether they can edit or not. So they might be able to type in dot, 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 and click save and see everyone's responses. They copy that first student, and then when they go to try and edit their, their response, the system says, please contact your instructor to edit this response. So then they've got to explain to you why they, need, why they feel they should be allowed to, to update that, that post. So the Q&A form, again, puts that control of the forum back into the hands of the instructor. And I, I should mention that um, of all the learning manage management systems that are available today, um, I've only heard of one other system out there aside from ours that has something similar to this. So it's something that's fairly unique to our system, and again, it's been met with a lot of positive uh, feedback from, from users of the system. Moving on from the forum, I'm going to go right into the quiz module, because I think that, hands down, the most widely used feature in uh, our learning management system is the quiz module. So clicking on the quiz module allows you to, the first page that it moves you to is the parameters page. And here's where you're going to give this a name, and you can call it whatever you want. So if this is a midterm or a final or a major exam, whatever you type in here is what your students will see, regardless of what we call the resource. And everywhere you go in our system, you'll see these little blue help buttons. I'm just going to grab my marker and circle a few of them for you. We do have a user manual that currently exists. It's about 200 pages long. It's uh, rather dry and, quite honestly, boring to read through, I know, because I'm the one that wrote it, and uh, I don't want to find myself having to read through this. And if you're anything like me, if I have a question about a particular item, all I really want to know is, for example, what does time limit mean? I really don't care what the rest of this stuff means. I just want to know what does time limit mean. So I can either uh, flip through 200 pages, or I can just click on this little blue help button that is basically it's a targeted user guide for just that one item. So we have these user guides throughout the entire uh, system. Whenever you can add something into the course or you can edit or manipulate something in the classroom, these blue buttons will be there to help guide you along. You can, much like the assignments, you can determine when the quiz is going to open and close. Now, from my own experience teaching some programs outside of Jones and Bartlett, one of the things that I like to, to talk about is that when I give a quiz now, I do the quizzes online. And for a long time, I wasn't doing that. And we'd have Tuesday, we'd meet Tuesdays and Thursdays. And on Thursdays, I'd give a quiz. And if, the quiz, if I gave them an hour or two hours to do the quiz of a three-hour class, that pretty much eats up a good majority of the time that I have with them, which means that I can't really spend a lot of time with them on Thursday doing um, a lot of things of, you know, that I'd want to be doing. And as I'm sure all of us can relate to on the call, all the instructors and all the professors on the call, we're, you know, constantly being asked to do more with less, and in this case, with less time. And, you, you know, you're, if students are expected to comprehend more, to receive more information, and to fully understand that information, you have less time to, to deliver it in, and the competencies are, are, are such that there are things that you have to be answerable to. Your students have to have a basic competency. And as a result of increased information and increased um, um, the increased curriculum standards, 
you're not given the time to actually fulfill all those needs. So how do you find that time without actually adding a minute to your program? And one of the ways you can do that, one of the ways I've done it, is to do the quizzes online. Now, when I set up a quiz now, I let, them, uh, let the students have access to it for 24 hours. If they want to complete the quiz at 2 in the morning or 2 in the afternoon, it doesn't really phase me. As long as once they touch the quiz, I still only give them that same hour to two hours that they would have in the classroom. I can come in here and I can decide how long they have access to it. I can decide how many questions per page are going to be displayed. That's not how many questions are in my quiz, it's how many questions can be displayed at a given time. I can choose whether I want to shuffle the order of the questions from student to student, and I can choose if I, if I want to shuffle the answer options um, from student to student. So uh, a good example of that is we're not so much worried, in, in the world of online learning, we're not so much worried about two students sitting next to each other and asking, hey, what's the answer number seven? We are. But we're also now keenly aware of the fact that these students could be 30 miles apart from one another, pick up their phone and text one another and say, hey, what's the answer to number seven? So what we want to do is we want to make this as difficult as possible for students to cheat. And one thing that um, for my colleagues that are on the line that they've, they've heard me say this before is that if somebody comes to you with a product and says that they've solved the problem of cheating, I'll tell you two things about that person. One, they've never actually stood in front of a classroom and taught. And two, they clearly have something to sell you. Because Cheating is, is not brand new to the world of online learning. Cheating has been a problem that instructors have had to face ever since the beginning of, of organized education. So this is simply a different medium, therefore there are different ways in which students can get around that system. So the idea is to make that, that prospect of cheating as, as painful as, pro as possible for the students. Minimize that opportunity. And one of the ways you can achieve that is by randomizing the order of the questions from student to student. So I might ask my, my colleague or my, you know, my classmate, hey, what's the answer to number seven? Well, they're not looking at the same number seven I am. But what if they answered that question a couple of minutes ago? And they think to themselves, okay, Bill, well, well that's A. So this next option here, shuffle within questions, helps prevent that. Because the same response for them, which was in fact A, for me, I should be selecting option D. So you have the ability to toggle those options within the quiz to really help cut down on, you know, on any opportunity for cheating. Now, building off the timing and the display areas, I'm going to scroll down a little bit further down the page to the security area because I do think it's important to mention we do have additional security options available in the system. The security options are pretty simple to set. They're either on or they're off. If you do turn them on, it'll open up the quiz in a full window for you. It'll disable right-clicking and jo uh, typical JavaScript commands, so Control-C or V or P to copy, print, or paste. And it will also make sure that if, uh, if the students try to, the only way that they can exit out of it is to close out of the quiz attempt. They won't have access to their start button or what have you. And the one thing that I would tell you is that even though that's a great security measure, the one thing that you need to keep in mind is that that should be used in concert with something like the timing or the display area because there's nothing stopping students from picking up a smartphone and going out to the web all the same. However, if you only give them 60 minutes to answer 60 questions, and you've randomized the order of the questions, and you've randomized the answer options, and they're hoping to pass this quiz compliments of Google, they're not going to get through all those questions in 60 minutes. It's just not possible. So you've got several tools at your disposal to help cut down or, or minimize the opportunity for cheating. You can choose how many attempts are allowed in a quiz, the grading method employed in the quiz, and one final option that we wanted to give to the instructors, and we really wanted this to be almost at a granular level, uh, the way that you can manipulate this quiz, is in the review options area. So one of the common things that I had heard from, from instructors previously was the security measures are great. The fact that you can restrict what they see and how many questions they can see, that's great. But if I do follow you know, that thing you've done where you open the quiz for 24 hours, what's to stop student one from cre um, completing the quiz within the first hour? and then simply visiting that quiz again, printing it, and handing it off to student two. Wouldn't they have all the answers and all the, the correct and, and incorrect responses? And so the review options area allows you, if you feel that that might be an issue, this allows you to come in here and at a very granular level, you can determine what gets shown to the student at what point in the quiz process. And the idea here is that if they can't see it, and if they don't have access to it, there's nothing for them to print, there's nothing for them to share. So you can say, okay, after Bill completes his attempt, he might finish the quiz within the first hour it's open. What are we going to show him? And in this case, we're only going to show him that he scored a 90% and the overall feedback, which is down here, and I'll explain that in a moment. Now, a few hours later, I come back, and the quiz is still open for attempts from my classmates. What can Bill see at that point? Well, Bill can only see that he scored a 90% and the overall feedback. Finally, after the quiz closes, and all attempts that, that are going to be allowed for, the, for this particular quiz have been made, 
what can Bill see if he comes in? So now it's 24 hours and one minute later. Now when I click on the quiz link, now it shows me the responses I made, the answers that the test bank was looking for, uh, page reference as far as feedback, and detailed rationale included in the test bank, the score that I received, and of course the overall feedback. So you have a, a very, um, it, it's a bit of a basic way of doing it, but it's, very, it's highly effective. So if you are concerned that there are students that might, um, that might otherwise try to print this out and you're, you're worried about relying on just the security option to prevent them from doing that, setting these, um, these different options here in the, re in the review area is going to all but eliminate that, that potential for, for students to be able to print something out because, again, there's nothing for them to print out. Now, I mentioned before about the overall feedback row. This is your ability to set a specific message that gets sent to a student based upon the grade that they receive. So I can type in here that anyone that scores 90% uh, or above, they'll see their score and they're also going to see this message coming directly from me. I can do this the exact opposite way and the message can be something that gives them, you know, action items or please see me or, you know, you, you did not pass this examination kind of thing. You can set this up to an unlimited number of thresholds. So if you do want to set it up in increments of 5%, uh, 10%, you can go, you know, anyone that scores from 50 to 55 sees one message, and then from 55 to 70, they see another message. And you have complete flexibility to add uh, any of those messages in here you want. Again, you don't have to use this. It's just a nice way of communicating to your students, you know, about their performance. And it's coming direct from you. So they're going to see the grade and then they're going to see this as a message as if you had sent it to them, um, almost like an instant messenger It's going to appear when they review their grades. The last step in adding a quiz is to click this button at the bottom that says Save and Display. And this is what's going to move you into the test bank. Now for all of our courses, we populate the classroom instances for you with all the digital content that's available from Jones and Bartlett for that particular curriculum. So whether that's something as simple as uploading PowerPoints or PDF files or something more advanced like some of our flash-based activities and interactive modules, if we've got a classroom for this, and like I mentioned before, if we don't have it already, it's, it's probable that it's already under development. Once we build out a classroom like this, we already populate it with all the content that you're going to need to get up and running with the course. So it's not as though we're just giving you a blank shell, if you will, and then telling you, here, you know, import whatever you want. We already have the classroom structure, the infrastructure of that back end for you, and all the content that you would get from us or expect from us is already organized for you by chapter. And it allows you to go in and start you know, manipulating things right away or starting to uh, add your own content alongside ours. Along those lines, the test bank is already preloaded in a number of our courses for you that don't have um, other ways of, of assessing students. And in here, you can come on in and choose the particular chapter of questions you want. Those questions will appear on the right-hand side. And I can just start putting some check marks in here, the questions I want to add into the test. Scroll down and click the button that says Add to Quiz. Once I add them to the quiz, they get pushed over to the left-hand side of the page. The quiz is automatically saved for me. There's nothing else I have to do. If I want to make changes to questions, any question that we put into our system, you can either click the magnifying glass and preview it in uh, a larger window. You can click the pencil and uh, icon here to edit the question in its entirety. So as much as we put our test banks, all of them, across all disciplines, as much as we put them through a thorough QA process, I think it goes without saying, and, and I think the only honest thing that I can tell you is, um, sure. does it happen that uh, every once in a while there might be a test bank question that, um, that leaves our warehouse that uh, isn't the best it could be? Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, incorrect. I'd say more often it's probably an issue that it's a bit ambiguous as opposed to truly being incorrect, but is it possible? And the answer is, of course it's possible. These are human eyes that are looking at these ultimately. So if you find something that needs to be corrected, or which is more often the case, if you find something that needs to be localized, so you have your own protocols, your own policies, your own way of doing things. Our question might not necessarily be wrong on its own, on its merit, but it'd be better if it was reflective of how you do things. You as an instructor have the ability to come in and completely alter this, this question the question itself, the correct answers, the distractors, and you can save this in one of two ways. You can either save this and override the original question we had put in here, so basically it removes ours and replaces it with yours, or you can save it as a new question, which means that you keep the original JMB question and add yours alongside it. And why you might do that is, is pretty straightforward. 
if you want to start uh, developing out your questions, you're not really deviating too far away from what we've put in here, but you're making it a bit more localized or you're, you're adding your own flair to, to the questions. If you save them as a new question, what you end up coming away with is basically two versions of a test bank. And where that can be beneficial to you as an instructor is if you have a student that needs to, to take a makeup exam and uh, they've, they've failed the first exam, they make a compelling reason as to why you should give them a second attempt at, at a new exam, you're not entirely sure you want them to see the exact same questions. You'd like there to be some variants. You now have these, these questions that were in there originally from us, and you could deploy those if you want. Or you can override our questions in, it, in their entirety and save, um, save over our questions. If you're giving a midterm or a final exam or some kind of major exam that requires multiple chapters to be part of this test, just come on in here and select the chapter you want to pull questions from. Questions on the right get updated to reflect that chapter. And again, I can just can put in some check marks and scroll on down and click to add that to the quiz. Now, I've chosen um, five questions from, uh, from this chapter here. And there's a total of 50 that are available for this chapter, which means there's 45 left in this particular chapter. So something else I can do is say, okay, I want all of my students to see the five questions from chapter four that I selected. But each time the quiz is generated, go out and pull five more that I haven't already selected and randomly pull those from chapter four each time the quiz is generated. So now you've made a quiz where students are going to see the first, you know, the, the same first nine or ten questions, but then they're going to get five, and it's quite possible they might not have some of the same questions from student to student. And let's not forget that we've already randomized the order of questions and the order of the answer options from student to student. So we've really gone a long way to help cut down on that potential for, uh, for cheating. And finally, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk about the, the question module here. And then I'm going to ask that if you have any questions, you type them into the chat box so I can maybe take any questions that may have come up thus far and, and then move forward into the communications in the final portion of the, the presentation. But if you do have questions you want to add, you have a variety of ways in which you can add those into the, into the system. Just choose what kind of question it should be, and, type, and the system will walk you right through how to add those in. If you have them in an electronic format already, click the Import button at the top here, and it will show you which formats we currently accept. So Blackboard, ExamView, uh, Respondus, WebCT. We, we accept um, 12 different formats that you can, you can take out of other systems and put them right into ours if you want. Once you've added those questions to your quiz, you can go back in the main classroom because that quiz has been saved for you. Much like the other assignments, it gets added into the calendar for you. It gets added into the upcoming events block. It is in the uh, administration panel. And you're able to see that in the, in the grades area. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the, um, the chat panel here. Now, for, for those that are in attendance, there is a toolbar at the top of your page. And if you move your cursor over it, you'll see it hover or appear. And there is a little box that says chat. So if you do have any questions, if I'll just take a, a moment or two and see if anyone types in any questions. And then I can answer those and then move forward into the communications, the grade book, and the reporting. And then that's going to be the point where we're going we're to terminate this presentation um, today. And again, this is recorded for, for folks if you want to watch this at a later time. So again, move your cursor to the top of the page. You'll see that toolbar up here. There is a box that should say chat. You can click on that. And then you can send your questions into the chat uh, box here. And I'll just wait a moment or two see if we get any questions in here. And if not, I'll just continue forward. OK, so a uh, question that I just received, um, um, and it's uh, uh, an ironic question only because it's one I just answered earlier today. Um, the, Moodle, the version of Moodle that we're currently using is the latest stable version, which is 199. Um, Moodle has several iterations, as I'm sure, based on the fact that you're asking that question, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume you already know that. Um, but um, we're using 199. Um, 2.0, as I'm sure you may already know, is out and it's in its production state. Um, but it's not without its own hiccups and its own uh, its own issues. So we're currently in a an R&D phase on on Moodle 2.0. But uh, 199 is the latest stable version, and that's what we've got all of our products running in. It's a great question. Thank you. Any other questions that I can take before I go on? Okay, I'm going to move on. But if you do have any questions as they come on up, again, hover to the, or move to the top of your uh, your screen. That toolbar will appear for you. You can type in your questions whenever you want, and I'll see a little little light flashing on my end that I've got a question waiting for me. So you can type those questions in if uh, if they come to mind after the fact. 
So as I mentioned before, we populate the, uh, the classroom for you with all the content. And again, depending on the type of content or the classroom itself, we may have different items that are available for you to use in your class. Now again, I mentioned before this is an EMT course, and one of the items in our um, Advantage package and some of the other bundles that we have for this course contains some of the, the flash-based activities that we're building out across all of our disciplines. And so for example, I'll just show you the ebook e-workbook here. And when I engage the, the ebook e-workbook, it's going to open up another window for me. And this is where students can, you know, they've got access to not only their ebook, this is a, a complete online version of the uh, of the textbook. We also have the e-workbook in here as well. And anything that the students do in here can be submitted to the gradebook for, for tracking purposes. We also have content in the classroom that consists of other items, such as you know, what I might call static content, so PowerPoints or Word documents or what have you. But regardless of what's uh, what we have for a particular curriculum, if it's in digital format, it's already going to be preloaded for you in the classroom. And you can use these, you can delete them, or you can simply hide them from student viewing as you see fit. Moving forward from the, you know, we've talked about the engaging the editing tools, we talked about um, the active syllabus area or that main content area, adding resources, linking to um, websites, and adding files talk about some of the cool things you can do with adding different activities or different content items into the course. And we're going to start to wrap up by talking about the messaging for the communications tools and then talking about the gradebook and the reporting tools that you have available to you as an instructor. So we organized the page in three distinct areas. And I know when I started I jumped right on into the main area or what I was referring to as the active syllabus. Each classroom is organized in a very uh, similar fashion so we have uniformity across all of our disciplines when someone's talking about um, an online course because it's entirely possible that you might be using more than one online course of ours at a time and because they're, they're complementary and we want to make sure we have the same look and feel. So on the left hand side of the page are where the administrative tools will reside. We talked about the active syllabus or the main content area where your students can spend the bulk of their time. And on the right hand side of the page is where your communication tools are going to live. Within the communications area you have your calendar and even though I mentioned that it is automatically integrated with the activities dropdowns or whenever you add something that has an activity, you can come in here and manually add items into the calendar. You can just simply click on the month and the year and then it'll ask you what do you want to add in here and you can type in those events. The upcoming events block is fully integrated with the calendar which means that regardless of how an event gets into the calendar, whether it's added automatically or added manually, if it gets added into the calendar it will get added into the upcoming events block for you automatically. This is a, basically the purpose of this is that it's a, a two-week snapshot of all pending deadlines for students. So you have in, in two areas, in technically three areas, on their home page is one area, you have three areas that are constantly reminding students, hey, this is coming due. Hey, you're supposed to be doing this. You really need to take action on this. So that it makes it very difficult for students to say they didn't know it was coming. And even though it's, it's not designed for, for that particular purpose, it's really more designed to make sure that students succeed. I think we can all agree that when a student comes into a course, regardless of the classroom, they're there to succeed. And uh, the number one thing that might hamper that ability is if they, if they don't know how to navigate a system, if something's too hard to use, if they, if they aren't made aware of um, different options that are, that are available to them or expectations that, are, um, that they have in the, uh, the class of their performance. When you add something into our course, it gets added into the calendar if it's an activity. If you add it in yourself, it gets added into the upcoming events block and it reminds them for up to two weeks out, and it also gets added on their home page. Finally, on the top right is the Message Center. And this is just as the name implies. This is a collection point for, uh, for messages or emails received within the classroom. But what happens is if I send a student of mine a message, or if they send me a message, it pops a little icon in here. Looks like a little envelope that would appear. And it sits there, and it allows me, when I, whenever I log in, it will allow me to read and reply to that. But it does something else as well, is that it waits for 15 minutes and then it sends out a, a message and it says, is, is Bill Online logged into this course? If yes, it pops open a window and it says, click here, you have a message, click this to read and reply. If not, it comes back here and it starts another countdown for another 15 minutes. If after 15 minutes, it, uh, it, uh, excuse me, after 15 minutes, it sends that notification back out and says, has Bill logged into the course? If no, it, it leaves the icon in the message center, but then it also forwards a copy of it to your personal email address you use to create your account. So what this means is that 
you're not too far away from getting an email from uh, from a student. So if, you know, if you've logged out of the, the classroom for the night, you've told your students 30 times. If you have an email, send it to me at my school address or Gmail or Yahoo. I think we, you know, we've all been there where you've got that one student that's just going to do it their own way. So they send you this frantic message at you know Friday at 10 o'clock at night. You've logged out for the for the evening, and you don't plan on logging in until Saturday afternoon. This helps ensure that any messages that are sent to you in the system aren't just sitting idly while um, you know while you're not logged in. It will forward it off to your personal email address. We've even had people use this uh, to send it to their uh, to their cell phones as um, SMS or uh, text message, um, so they can get notified that those those messages are waiting for them. Okay, so moving over to the left hand side of the page and entering into the final section of, of this presentation for today, we're going to be talking about the, uh, the grades, and then we're going to talk about the reporting functionality in the system. So the grade book takes on the look and the feel of an Excel spreadsheet, and that's done by design. The reason for that is, is that it allows you to export into Excel, and if it looks like Excel, it plays very well with Excel. So um, there aren't any issues with uh, formatting or, or problems along those lines. You can save this right to your desktop. The benefit to instructors, of course, is that at the end of every course, if you want to keep a, keep a record now of what you're doing on paper, you're able to keep that same record just in a digital file and save it right to your desktop. So you can export this either as a text file, open document, or an Excel spreadsheet. You have, as your students begin coming into the course, they begin populating in the column on the left-hand side. As you begin adding graded items, those begin populating off on the right-hand side. Every gradebook has an overall average row. That is just as the name implies. It's a very fast way for you to determine how your students are doing as a class. So if you have 20 attempts made on something, you can scroll to the bottom and see, okay, the class average is a 90%, um, or maybe the class average is a 70%. I'm gonna bring up another grade book with an ex some examples of that here. So I can scroll down and see that my students have, um, okay, so there's 20 attempts here and that's an 82% and that's okay. But this quiz here, quiz 10, the class average is a 74%, and for me, that's a bit of a problem. So now what I can do is, as the instructor, I can scroll back up to the top of the page. The resource becomes a hyperlink that I can click on, so I can click on the chapter name. This will then run out and generate a report for me and show me the individuals um, and how they performed on the quiz and the individual marks they made and on what questions. So this might allow me to very quickly identify, well, here's the problem. Questions four, five, and six were consistently um, marked incorrect. So maybe you know it's a problem with comprehension. Maybe it's an issue with the question itself, and I can just click on the question name right up here, and I can review that question. And if I do want to make a change, I can make a change right here within the grade area, and then force a regrade across all my students. So this gives me a time and date stamp, total time spent on the quiz, grade received, and the individual marks they made. I can scroll on down to the bottom of the page, and I can see a quick bar graph and show me you know of my students for this quiz how did the majority of them do? And we see overwhelmingly that the majority of attempts were in the 70 to 80% range. If this isn't enough information for me, or if I, if I want even further detail on the individual quiz questions, I can click on the item analysis button. Clicking this is gonna generate a report on the individual quiz questions. It'll, it'll generate a statistical item analysis on those questions, giving you the standard deviation, the mean, the correct answers versus the distractors, the percentage of individuals who answered in what fashion, and it will allow you to review these questions and make changes right on the fly if you want. So you've got three levels of reporting in the gradebook. And at e each level or each stage, you can save those or export those as Excel or open document um, formats if you want to save them right to your computer. So this would be the most granular level. This is the item analysis on the individual quiz questions. If you feel there's a problem with the questions themselves, this is the best tool available for you to be able to identify those problem questions. This intermediary level that allows you to see how did your students do? Question for question, how did they respond? Did they get credit for it or not? How did they do overall? And how did they do as compared and contrasted against one another? And then finally, the, that top level or that 40,000 foot view, the, the actual the grades themselves. Within the grade book, you have the ability, and again, I just want to reiterate that the purpose of today is not to make you proficient in our system. It's simply to let you know what features exist we will work with you as many times as you need to get up and running with your, um, with your system and rolling this out to your students. If we need to do a train the trainer session with you, you know, once, twice, four, five times, as many times as it takes until you feel comfortable. So I don't want you to think that because you're seeing a lot of information that it's so overwhelming that, you know, you're going to think not, you know, about using this. Just understand that we have, 
we have you covered from A to Z. So not only in getting you the, the technology or the product, but also after you've decided to adopt it and supporting you going forward throughout the entire duration of your course. So with that said, one of the things you can do with your gradebook that we have a lot of instructors interested in is I can say, okay, I want to give quizzes, and quizzes should be worth 30% of the students' overall grade, and major exams are worth 50% of the students' overall grade, and all their homework is worth 20% of the students' overall grade. And now what I can do is I can start dumping in my quizzes into this bucket here, my major exams into this bucket, my homework assignments into this one. I'll see each individual mark the student received. So I'll see that um, Dana received a 94 and a 90, but then I'm going to see the, that average, and I'll know that that average of all those quiz attempts is only worth 30% of the student's overall grade. I can set this up to be uh, either follow the duration of a program, or we can set this up to be semester-based if, you know, if you're running a program that runs um, you know, if, if one program leads into another and it's basically two semesters with the same group of students, we can set that up and work with you on that as well. I mentioned before you have the ability to come in here and customize the scales. So if you want to have something that isn't a numeric value but simply pass or fail, you can do that in the Choose an Action drop-down area. So the gradebook is a highly configurable area of the, of the site. There is a lot going on in the gradebook. But once you get a ba the way that it's set up as a, as a basic out-of-the-box kind of setting is it makes use of the most basic settings. It, it goes with the presumption that you simply want to collect all of the scores that a student receives. So um, you, you want to see that over the, the entire program they've engaged in 18 different graded assessments and what's their overall average. It goes from that presumption that that's what you want to use. Once you want to start making changes to that, you have the flexibility to go in and, and add any kind of um, grading rubric that you want to the system. And finally, we're going to talk about the reports area, and then again, I'm going to open up the, um, uh, the chat capability. I think actually at that point what I'll do is I'll open up the phone lines as well. But the reporting tool allows you to go in and generate activity reports on what students have done in the course. Well, I should actually say all users in the course because if you have co-instructors or support instructors or adjunct faculty and you want to see what they're doing, you can pull up reports on them. Now, using a very simple approach, using drop-down menus so that it keeps an eye on functionality, you can choose a particular individual or you can see all individuals, a particular day or all days since your class went live. Maybe you only want to see who actually watched that, uh, that video that we, we talked about earlier or you want to see everything that they've done. You can display this right on the page, right here on your screen, or again, much like the gradebook, you can save this as an Excel spreadsheet or open document spreadsheet. Clicking get these logs is going to run out and give you time and date stamp, the IP address that the individual logged in from, who logged in, and what they did. And if this was a quiz attempt, I could click on the link and it would show me the actual quiz attempt from that student. So instead of you having to jump back, to, instead of me looking at this and saying, okay, um, Jane has completed her quiz. Now I must go back to the gradebook to see what she got. Instead of having you jump through what we thought to be fairly silly hoops, what we did is we integrated it all together so that if you come in here first, if your first action is go to the reports and generate a report and see who's completed the quiz only, and you see Jane's completed the quiz, it seems silly that you'd have to go back to the gradebook to see her grade when instead we can just provide a hyperlink that opens up that quiz attempt for you. Now I'm not talking about just the grade. It actually shows you the, the attempt the attempt that she made. So it shows you all the questions that she answered, how she answered, whether it was correct or incorrect, and what the correct response was, along with her grade. So you have access to all those items right within the reports area that you can just pull by clicking on the hyperlinks. So with that said, um, that brings us right about to the, to the top of the hour, and I want to be cognizant of everyone's time here. So I do want to open up the, uh, the phone lines. I'm going to go ahead and unmute those. And I would ask that... Um, while we don't have the, the number of folks on here that we had originally anticipated, we still do have a number of people on this call. So um, we're going to open this up and see if we can't uh, take some questions verbally here. So let's just take a moment to do. And anyone that might have a good deal of background noise, if you can just um, um, mute your line or, um, or kind of move to another area, that'd be great because a little bit of background noise can make it difficult for us to hear everyone. Now, the phone line should be open for everybody. Does, does anyone have any questions? I know it was a lot of information, and I know we took a short break there in the middle with some of the text-based questions, but um, I just want to make sure that any questions that get um, that, that need to be answered, um, we can take. And I've got a couple, actually. I'm just going to hold up right there and say I do have a couple in queue in the chat area here. And, okay, so, so but to answer your question, <clears throat> the, the, the best thing that you need to do 
Uh, first, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited that you like, uh, that you like what you saw. But um, the first thing that we need for you to do is just to contact your sales rep, and the sales representative will get that, uh, get that ball rolling for you. So you'll be able to, to get access to the system. It's a very fast turnaround. We'll get you into it. We'll get you the documentation you need. We'll get you what you need to get your students into it. And then also, um, you'll then be provided with contact information for our support team so that we can start um, working with you to set up some training sessions if you want. And usually what we do is we like to give access to the instructors and then let them have at it and start playing with it because, you know, a lot of folks, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're tactile in nature. They want to touch something and actually get in there and start playing with it. And then when they run into those, those obstacles, they can come on back to us or we can train uh, right off the bat with you. So it's a great question. And again, uh, start with the, the sales representative um, that covers your state and they'll get you squared away with that right away. And as far as you um, moving to the, the next edition of the EMT book, that isn't a problem. We have we have it available for the 10th edition, and uh, we can get you squared away with that pretty quickly. And uh, Noel, um, to answer your question, um, that's something that um, you and I obviously have a um, um, a standing uh, professional relationship where you know we've been in contact before. What I'd like to do is I'd like to answer your question, but I'd also like to do it directly with you offline um, in more detail. I will answer your question though and say that for those individuals that are on this call that might be using JV Course Manager. Um, I want you to rest assured that we are cognizant of the fact that at some point we're going to be moving those people into Navigate. So we are going to be migrating in. We're not going to be making any changes where, you know, you're going to go to bed on a Wednesday night with JV Course and wake up Thursday and, oh, by the way, you're on Navigate. It's not going to happen that way. We're, we're going to work with each individual instructor that's currently on JV Course. And we're going to migrate them over when it's most appropriate for your needs as well as ours um, because, you know, obviously in the case of some of our programs, they run year-round. And we don't want to set an arbitrary date that works for us, but might negatively impact, you know, a good percentage of our customers. Um, you know, Noel, yourself included, where you run several several classes already online. We want to make sure that we work directly with you. So, um, hopefully, I answered that generically enough so that other JB Course users on the call can can you know take that sigh of relief now. But uh, Noel, I'm going to call you directly. Um, I'll, I'll call you today after after this session, and uh, we'll go through some of that stuff uh, in detail. Okay, with that, that, that's all the, uh, the text questions or the, the chat questions I had. Does anyone have any questions they want to ask? Uh, Bill? Yeah. Uh, I had uh, hospital restrictions. I couldn't see the web, and I know it's going to be, uh, uh, you know, broadcast on the site. Uh, is what you talked about today, is that applicable to the ninth edition or only to the 10th edition? We do have um, our, um, our JB Course system, and that, that kind of goes back to what that last question was, was, well, what if I'm already using JB Course? What happens to the, the new system? So the ninth edition is available on our JB Course platform. So the short answer is yes. We, we have an online classroom. It looks and feels very similar to what we just saw here. Um, and even though we, you know, we're like everyone else, we, we like what's new and shiny, we also have a healthy appreciation for not shocking customers. And we want to make sure that the transi transition to the new system wasn't sh so overwhelmingly different that it was like they had to learn new systems. So what you saw here today is directly applicable to the system that hosts the ninth edition. Okay. Or, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. You just said you weren't able to see it. But what we were talking about, rather, is directly applicable to, to what's on the ninth edition as well. Okay. Bill, this is Don in Colorado. Don, how are you today? Good. Uh, I, I'm going to have a lot of other questions, but for right now, the JB Core stuff that we've been using, is there going to be a way of importing stuff from the JB Course to this program, or would you start fresh with everything in this program? Well, I think there's two things that we're, we're looking at there, because there's there's one piece, which is the, the content from the curriculum. Now, that's going to be changing from the ninth edition to the 10th edition, so how much of those content items that came from us originally you're going to want to move over, we'll leave that up to you. But I think the more directly to your question is, you know, what about all those things? And I know, you know, obviously, like Noel, you and I have spent some time on the phone before. I know what you're doing. I know all the courses you're doing. Um, and you've, you've spent some time kind of making these courses your own, and you've add, added your own content into the class. Those particular items absolutely will be moved over for you or can be moved over if you so decide to have those things over. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions today? Okay, for my colleagues that are on the on the line, um, uh, Alicia, I believe uh, we have uh, some of our marketing folks. Is there anyone on the line that has anything else that they'd like to add before I before I close out this session today? Okay, so what I'd invite everyone to do is, 
If you do want more information, you can certainly contact your sales representatives. You can also go to our website, which is www.jvlearning.com for more information. Also, all of our contact information is there. You can get in touch with us. Anyone that wants more information about the technology or uh, you know, for the individual that had a hard time seeing the webinar because of the restrictions in the hospital, I'm more than happy to do this one-on-one -on -one with you if you know, you're on a home computer or, or one that allows you to you know, get past that firewall. Um, so just feel free to reach out to your sales rep and we get that coordinated. So with that, if there are no other questions, I'm going to close out of the session for now and again welcome you to visit our site and thanks for the time today.